Um, today, I have. Some, I will give you this, my solutions and the, also the notes for this week's stuff. So just go ahead and hand those around, please. And um, <clears throat> let's get into the new material. Are there some questions? I forgot when I made the homework due now. Thursday. Oh, I don't have to do till Thursday. Yeah, did you want the, well, I'm covered. Did you want to keep these then, these homework? Oh, I guess I better get the homework solutions. <laughs> I probably shouldn't look at them. Probably. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Okay, so I made it for Thursday, so I have to change the website again. Okay, because I still have it up as April 11th please and April 18th. Ask <laughs> yes, please. Yes, that's what I thought. I really did have a bad weekend. I couldn't even remember when I changed it. Okay, so what are the questions? <laughs> Four six, I'm still not really understanding that well. Four point six. And I guess, like, um. A specific question about four point six. Well, the first one, the number two. I was just wondering, is it going to be kind of following that proof at all, or is it completely like? Okay. You know. I think I give. Yeah, I think I. Basically, there's a lot on lemma four six seven. Okay, is what I think annihilators and stuff. um, Is what this homework is about. Then there's one little thing about the inverse of the uh, adjoint operator or something, but that's how you handle it before. You show that they, the, you know, you, you basically had a problem like that before, okay? You show that a product of operators is the identity, and therefore one of the operators is the inverse of the other, okay? And then you have to show that the norm, in it, the norm with the, that the norm is bounded or something like that, okay? So that's the first problem. The second problem has to do with annihilators, and that's about closed sets and so on and so forth. So that's actually, I think, in problem 4.5, number 9, the main thing is I want you to verify the first if and only if in the hint. Um, so just a second. Are you talking about 4.62? Yes, I will. I haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. Verify first if and only if in hint. Okay, that's the key step in 4.5 number 9. All right? 4.6 number 2. Basically, what you have is that x equals a Hilbert space, okay, instead of a norm space. You want to verify 4.6.7 via a simple proof. Well, what you have is that What's, basically, it's the Hilbert space theory. What you have is that if you've got a point x naught in H minus y, and here's a closed subspace y, closed, okay, then we can do the orthogonal projection, right? And that gives, and that gives the distance. That's what we, the theory of the beginning of chapter three gave you. This is the distance, delta, where this is a right angle, okay? delta is obtained in that way. So you use the projection theorem. And you don't actually need to use the resource representation theorem, but it's like you're using the resource representation theorem. You're using a resource representation of the linear functional. You're just not using the theorem, per se. Maybe one little aspect of the theorem. All right? Plus idea of re, of 3.8 dash one. Okay. All right. So you can just actually write down a functional that does the job. Just write it down, and then verify its properties. So what you have is that, what, this was some point y naught, and then the difference here was what, x naught minus y naught? We called that a something else. Okay, but anyway, that was, that's the distance. The length of that vector is the distance. Delta equals, if I call that z naught, then the length of z naught is equal to delta. That's the projection theorem, right? Where this is the vector z naught, z naught. Okay, this was the, the head of the vector x naught. This was the head of the vector y naught. Okay, I achieved the distance in that problem. Okay, so that'll just come down. Write one linear functional, bounded linear functional down. You have to verify three properties, right? Well, maybe you haven't looked at the problem. 
Okay, the linearity will be trivial if you use the reef representation idea. Show that the norm of the function was one. Yeah, you need to show the norm is one. Right. Um, and you need to show that it annihilates y. Right. It annihilates y. Okay. So f tilde of y is equal to zero. But that should be fairly simple. So it's the projection theorem you need, okay, on that problem. Um, um, and then 468 is again um, 46 number 6. That's very much like the previous problem, 45 number 9. And then you're going to, in 46 number 8, you're going to use this lemma again. For one, it's an if and only if one half of it is trivial. And the other half, you're going to use 467 again. Okay, for one half of the equivalence, for the hard half. So it's all about playing with annihilators, just a definition, and closed subsets and so on. I think the fact that you've, that, uh, you've got a closed subset, A is something closed, so it's set up for the uh, lemma 467 in there again. The lemma 467 doesn't apply unless Y is closed, okay? So you need a closed subspace, but then it, look at the closure of these spans again in 46 number 8. So uh, it's about annihilation and uh, lemma 467. That's all this homework is about, roughly. That notation on number eight—that's just saying when um, f is going to be in. Okay, they're saying that if yeah, f's. it just says that when f is restricted to m, then then, then it, the functional is zero, and therefore it's zero on the span of m. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you'll see from your homework that also implies that it's going to be zero on the closure of the span, because when it's zero on something, it's also going to be zero on the closure. All right, by continuity, it's bounded linear functional. Okay. It's a bonolinear functional and therefore it's continuous. And therefore you can go, you know, if f of xn is equal to zero, okay, and xn goes to x in norm, then f of xn goes to f of x, and therefore f of x is equal to zero, okay? So that's the basic step that you've used, I, I think, at least a couple, three times already in your homeworks this year to, to easily get that f restricted to, that f will also be zero on a. If f is zero on m, then automatically f is zero on a if f is a continuous linear functional, okay? So here's what I'm saying. f, bounded linear functional, and on x equals a norm space. So if there is some concept of a continuity, okay? <laughs> okay. Then uh, f equal to zero on M mean uh, or written otherwise written F restricted to M equals zero. Okay, implies F equal to zero on A equals the the closure of the span of M. The span of M is just all finite linear combinations of elements of M. Since F is linear, that will automatically annihilate the span of M. Since F is continuous, it will annihilate the closure of the span of M. Okay? Well, what I mean by annihilate means just send to zero. Okay. So this is, this is, this is something you've done before. This implication, and that just a couple, you know, that'll help. So you don't want to miss that part of the homework, okay? All right. So I don't think it should be too bad. Uh, yeah, I guess this is the more interesting problem, but it's really not difficult. You'll you'll be able to scratch it out, no problem. I think just a little trial and error, if anything else. We're trying writing down a functional in terms of an inner product that <laughs> does the job, right? Okay, you'll, you'll eventually get it.
by a method of successive approximation if need be, okay? Yeah. All right. So there's a new homework assignment out there on NALS 2. Um, it's mostly on section 4.7. That'll be due in another week and a half or so, or nine days. So let's get started on these notes. Uh, did everybody get to notes 10 now? Did anybody not get that? Okay. Uh, uniform botanist theorem. It's kind of an interesting problem. Um, are there other questions though before we go on? So people, uh, there was an idea that uh, came up to, uh, to uh, get, do some project work and so on. Uh, that's still floating around, so I haven't put too much thought to it, but how many people are still interested in doing some kind of project in this course? There's at least one person. Uh, that's one way to deal with it. One way to deal with it. Okay. Yeah, why don't, why don't we put it like that or something? Drop an extra couple homework or something like that? Yeah, no doubt. Okay. I'll take those under advisement now. So, okay, we'll have to find some times. Um, I was hoping to get to do some spectral theory of self-adjoined operators but in Chapter 9, but we might have to give the uh, one-hour cover-it-all lecture. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe somebody would like to take a piece of it if that's what would be done. You know, Is that way that you can kill two birds with one stone? So think about it. Uh, so if, if you would like to contribute in that way, some of chapter 9, or if you'd rather do some of your own stuff, you were talking about wavelets or whatnot. When I talked to you, Dr. Phillips, he thought the reef basis would be pretty applicable to functional analysis. Okay. So come up, something up, come up with something there then. All right. Good idea. So let's get into the bare category theorem. Um, so let's just have a definition. So that's just how it's pronounced. Yeah, we can just call it the, yeah, bear. I didn't know if it was bear or by ear or... I think it's just bear. Okay. Uh, I've never heard it called anything else anyway. Okay. Um, also, we just call it abbreviated to the category theorem. Let's have a definition first. What we have to talk about is what is a rare set. Definition. So X is a metric space. We're going to be working with metric space first. M, a subset of X, is rare or also called nowhere dense. What does it mean, nowhere dense? If the closure of M, okay, contains no open ball. So even if I close up M, it still doesn't contain any open set, okay? It's still thin. The closure of M is still thin. Think about it in, in two or three dimensions. Um, uh, well, I guess a surface, a typical surface in three dimensions, right? It doesn't... It's closed already in itself, let's say, or maybe you know you could close it if it's not closed. Uh, it's lower dimensional. Okay, that would be something that's nowhere dense. Okay, it's basically lower dimensional because mm -hmm. the the if you if it contains the open ball automatically, it contains the full dimension. Okay, the open ball is is full dimensionality. Okay, that's the idea. If, it, if we think about it in terms of dimension, okay? Once it contains an open ball, then it's got, you know, all the dimensions. Fully fledged, so to speak. But we're just saying that, that uh, no open ball there, okay? But now, of course, a surface doesn't cover all of space unless it was a space filling surface. So then, uh, you know, that's a kind of, you know, thing about that surface, okay? What is it? Okay, that's definition one. No word dense. No open ball. Okay, so what's an example? A single point, of course, <laughs> on the line. It's such a set. A single point would have its own closure, you know, would be. Okay, but now what's the next definition? The next definition has to do with non meager. Okay, um, meager. Okay, M is meager. This is one A B. M is meager. 
or of the first category. So we have two we have synonymous terms. I'm going to use the word meager. Or the first category in X if M is a union, a countable union of rare sets. Okay. So here's a, what's an example. An example would be um, just take um, maybe rectangle surfaces in three dimensions. Yeah, just take all the planes parallel to the xy plane in three dimensions at rational coordinates on the z-axis. That would be a countable union of rare sets. So it looks like that pretty much fills space, but it's still called meager. Okay, in this context. All right. So a whole bunch of sheets lined up. Okay, countable union or sheets like that. Uh, think about it in terms of maybe you think about it in terms of the rational numbers. You don't think that's really that big, but it is. But it does. Um, that is a meager set. The rational numbers in the line is a meager set. Example. Q in R, okay? All right. So a single point <laughs> is also rare. Okay, so there's a union of single points, the rational numbers. So that corresponds to this sheet of paper lined up at rational coordinates on the z-axis. <laughs> okay, see, then uh, M is non-meager. Well, a subset, let's just say, not M, a subset. Really, I should use A. I'd like to use, uh, well, whatever. Uh, a subset is, I think I should say a subset. I don't like, like the word M. Uh, well, A is meager. Uh, what do I want to call it? I only want to call the M the rare thing. Uh, I want to call this something else. A subset. Let's see, what do we call it in the book? I don't want to keep it in the letter M. So I want to keep M for the rare thing. Is they could give a different name here. Um, no, he does continue to use the letter M. Oh, well. Um, I don't think that's advisable, but... Um, <clears throat> Okay, no, I'll just leave it M then. We'll just deal with it. I'll just say a subset is non meager or of the second category. If it is not meager. <laughs> In X, okay. So it just means um, it can't be written as a countable union of rare sets. Okay, it can't be written as a countable union of rare sets. So all right. that's the cat. That's the definition. What's the theorem? If you're in a complete metric space, then um, the whole space is non meager in itself. Okay. Do you have an example? Yeah, let's just have this. Oh, the non meager case? Yeah. The non meager case, uh, well, it, the space itself is going to be what the theorem is. Like the real line in itself. Or the real line in itself is going to be what we'll see. The real line R in itself is non meager. Okay, by according to the, 
the theorem, which is uh, uh, theorem 472, pair category theorem. Okay. Okay. Um, however, a, a space could be meager in itself. An incomplete space may be meager in itself. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So it is possible for a space to be meager in itself. You just sort of take a meager looking space. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, the rationals. Okay itself is a metric space. It's kind of meager. Okay. <laughs> it's only just a countable union. It's not an uncountable set. But you, what you want to do is you want to have an uncountable space if you can. Uh, but, you know, an uncountable incomplete space. Okay. Which you want to have. But, so, what about the irrationals? Are they meager? or non-meager in the line. But R minus Q in R. What's your guess? No, that's right. No, they're not meager. Okay? They're not meager. So let's go ahead and prove that and we'll actually we'll prove the Bare Category Theorem uh, in the process, okay? We're going to do two things at once. We're going to show the example, and we're going to prove Bare Category Theorem by showing the irrationals are non-meager, okay, in R. Okay, the proof, the proof will, uh, proof will give, the proof will provide proof of of 4.7-2 in the process. All right, so I guess the main thing is that this, um, stopping, starting on the top of page 2. Suppose, on the contrary, that um, R minus Q is Suppose, on the contrary, that the irrationals is equal to union AK. K goes from 1 to infinity, means countable union, uh, where AK are rare in the real line. So they're nowhere dense. That is, AK bar contains no open ball, no open interval for all K. All right. Now what I want to do is, um, because the irrationals are incomplete, I want to get, I'm going to use the completeness of the rationals, excuse me, of the real line. I need to use completeness of the ir <sighs> of the real line, completely the real line. So what I'm going to do, therefore, uh, now, so what I'm going to do, enumerate the rationals, put, put Q equal, the fact that I can enumerate the rationals is, is good, R2, R3, and so on, enumeration of rationals. Then what I claim is then that even though I don't get the whole space as a union of these nowhere dense sets, then by modifying this nowhere dense sets by adding one point to each, I'll get the whole space, R, right? So put, put this and set, uh, let MK be equal to AK union the singleton RK. And so the real line is the union of these MK. Now I claim these MK are also nowhere dense. K goes from 1 to infinity. And 
And so then I'll be back to just proving that the real line is not meager in itself. Okay, so I'm going to this little step here, and then I can reduce to just proving that the real line is not meager in itself. Is that okay? How do I prove that but claim MK is also rare in R? How do you prove that? Well, I claim that the I can easily, if I add one point to a set, then I can actually uh, co compute the um, closure of that new set because as follows, indeed, uh, what I need to do is show that mk bar is equal to ak bar union the single point. I claim that's true. This is a statement about the closure. Okay. Um, how would I do that? Well, okay. I certainly have, uh, what, what do I have? If um, proof of this, indeed let's call this one, then. proof of one. Suppose, um, M is a little, suppose, uh, what did I call it? Suppose M is a limit point of MK. All right. So the closure is this, is this set union its limit points, right? What could it be? Either it's a limit point of A already, okay, or it's RK. I can't get any new limit points. If I add one point, I can't get any uh, basically new limit points, roughly speaking. All right? So um, then either M is equal to RK or M is not equal to RK. That's pretty obvious, all right? All right. I mean, it's, M has to be somewhere. Okay. <laughs> if M is R K, then I'm covered, right? Uh, so cons assume that M is not equal to R K. All right. If M is R K, then uh, that limit point is in this union. Okay. So I'm covered. I need to consider A K union, R K union, all possible limit points, and I've covered this one. Suppose M is not equal to R K. If M is not equal to R K, then M equals a limit of points from AK alone. It doesn't help throw in a bunch of RKs, all right, because they're always a distance at least epsilon away. All right, so after some point, I can just throw away the RK. So in other words, so M is in the closure of AK, all right? So I've shown that any limit point is in one of those two. Therefore, limit points of uh, MK, all right, um, uh, are a subset of AK bar union RK. Therefore, MK bar equals MK union the limit points is contained in AK bar union RK. All right, but obviously any one of those points in here is in the closure, but also, um, so I'm going to get, but obviously anything in the closure, Anything um, here, it does belong to MK, but obviously AK bar union RK is contained in the closure of MK because anything that's the limit point of A is automatically the limit point of M 
and our K was automatically, it was already in M. Okay? Here was M. The closure has to contain the set itself, so RK has to be in there. All right, so this RK is always in here. Okay? So I've got equals now. Okay? So, I mean, it's just a little ditty to show this equation. So, the NKs are also rare. Because, hence, okay, one is proved. But, MK is always. MK, uh, but therefore, MK is rare. Okay? Why? Because if I add one point to a set that doesn't contain any open interval, is that going to now contain an open interval? No. That's again just working little cases, because if I add one point, Let's say, oh, maybe, you know, now I make a whole interval by adding one point. No. How could you? Okay, because if you had, then you could, one side of that point well, already would have been an interval. Okay? At least one side or the other. Okay? So, okay. So, that's pretty easy. All right? So, you work through this thing, and actually they have kind of a problem in there. You're going to have to generalize this, what I'm doing here. That's why I'm doing it. Because <laughs> they have kind of a hard problem. Show that... If the complement of a meager subset M of a complete metric space itself is non-meager, okay? That's exactly what we're doing. We're taking the complement of a meager subset. This is a meager subset. Q is a meager subset, all right? The complement of a meager subset is then non-meager. What you actually have to do um, is use the fact that, um, um, in general, um, that BK union AK bar is a subset of BK bar union AK bar. You only need to use subset here, okay? So it will be enough to show that um, um, this inequality, roughly speaking, in general. All right, so I'll just give that as a hint to problem of 4.7 number 6. That you may have some questions about. But it's roughly this construction. Okay? That's why I'm doing it. Okay? So the irrationals, it would have been much nicer for them just to say prove the irrationals are non meager. <laughs> but then I wouldn't have been able to show you this part. But anyway, <clears throat> um, okay, here I'm actually able to show equal. All right? Because, it's such a, because the uh, the BK is such a simple set, it's a singleton point. Okay. All right. So the MK is itself first. So now I have the real line is written as a countable union of rare sets. So in other words, it's uh, it's meager. Okay. In itself. Let's see if I get a contradiction from that. So I want to show a contradiction. Goes on the contrary. Okay, so I've got this. Okay. So, uh, so now we um, suppose on the contrary we have we thus have M excuse me R equals union M K uh, M K rare. All right. So what can we do now? Now, therefore, um, here's, the, here's the basic proof of 472. Proof, proof of 472 follows now. In the, uh, follows as below. Well, is as follows. What we're going to do is we're going to use the completeness of the space, R. R, R is a complete metric space, but the, the general proof for a complete metric space is going to be exactly as we're going to show. So the Bayer's theorem is if you have a complete metric space, then it's not meager. In other words, this, this is impossible. Okay? It's not meager in itself. That is, it cannot be written as a countable union of rare sets. 
So we'll state that down at the end. So what am I going to do to prove 472? The idea is if I've got it written this way, then first consider um, M1 bar complement. All right? M1 bar contains no open set. All right? Therefore, certainly it's not the whole space. Okay? And we assume we had non empty space. Okay? In this bare category theorem, we assume that X is not trivial. So this, is, this doesn't contain anything open, therefore, this is non empty and open. Okay? Because it's the complement of a closed set. Okay? M1 bar itself didn't contain any open sets, and therefore uh, this didn't fill the whole space, because the whole space is open. Okay? Uh, which doesn't, doesn't have any interior points, and every point of the whole space is interior. Okay, so there's got to be some points running around left. Okay? So, we complement that's not empty and open. Let P1 in this um, M1 bar complement, okay, uh, and epsilon 1 uh, less than a half, I think we're going to take, greater than 0, so that B, P1, epsilon 1, um, which in this case is just P1 minus epsilon 1 to P1 plus epsilon 1 in the real line case. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Is um, still inside this um, complement equals R minus M1 bar. Okay. The complement can be written this way. R minus M1 bar. Okay, <clears throat> so you've got this first ball, okay, so there's a ball, okay, and maybe it has a small radius, but it's in there, okay, so now, um, now M2, now we're going to continue the next step, now M2 is rare, so it doesn't contain any ball, okay, So, so M2 bar complement, all right, I'm sorry, M2 bar does not contain B, P1, Epsilon 1, because M2 bar doesn't contain any open set, so in particular can't op contain this one. All right, so maybe then, so this is, let's say, you know, somehow, maybe somehow um, it contains a bunch of points of this ball. Okay, but it doesn't contain the whole thing. Okay, somehow it might actually cover the whole thing, right? So here's M2, okay, closure, okay, M2 closure has all those points, but somehow it doesn't contain the whole ball, okay? So there's somehow some little open ball stuck inside here, okay? That it can't contain. Because M2 bar is, is closed and therefore M2 bar complement is open. All right, M2 bar complement intersect B, P1, Epsilon 1 is open and non-empty. Non-empty is the key, okay? No sets are open, too, but it's non-empty. Because M2 bar does not contain the whole thing, therefore the complement intersects this in a non-empty set. So there's a non-empty open set, therefore there's another ball, a whole ball inside there, okay? So, so this, is in, uh, this is the complement of M2 bar in here, all right? So now I'm going to take another point, P2, and stick it inside there. So P2 is going to actually be inside the original ball. The center of, the, of another ball is going to be inside the original ball, okay? So take 
P2 in B, P1, epsilon 1, and epsilon 2 less than 1 half epsilon 1, but still positive. We might have to be much, much smaller, but anyway, less than that. Okay, so that B, P2, epsilon 2 is inside M2 bar complement intersect B, P1, epsilon 1. Okay? Therefore, what you have is that um, already BP1 epsilon 1 was outside uh, M2, M1 bar. This is already outside M1 bar. So already I'm going to be outside M1 bar, okay? Which is in R minus M1 bar, therefore, okay? But now it's also inside R minus M2 bar because I've got it outside M2 bar, all right? It's inside both of these, so it's inside the intersection. So therefore, uh, put intersect, okay, <laughs> which is equal to R minus M1 bar union M2 bar, okay, like that, okay? It's outside both M1 bar and M2 bar. Using the word outside is the easiest way to write it. Okay, let's put it this way. I'll write it in words so you can understand. BP1 epsilon 1 is already outside M1 bar. Okay? BP2 epsilon 2 is in BP1 epsilon 1. So BP2 epsilon 2 is outside. M1 bar as well. But also by construction, but further, by construction, BP2, epsilon 2, not at BP1, but BP2 now is outside M2 bar. All right. Therefore, uh, BP2 is both outside both M1 bar and M2 bar. Ah, so M1 bar and M2. M1 bar and M2 bar, i.e., BP2, epsilon 2 is in uh, R minus the, the union of the two closures. Okay, I'm kind of running into, let's, let's not do that. Let's put it like this. Okay, M, it, you can write it either two ways. It's, um, yeah, you can write it either R minus the union of the closures or you can write it or, or equal to uh, M1 bar union M2 bar uh, complement if you want to write it that way. Okay, it's the same thing. Okay? Equals M1 bar complement and M2 bar complement. Okay, it's in the intersection. Okay, so uh, let's just not write it this way. Let's just, this, this is easier. So now, You've got it like that. Now you continue by induction, okay? Continue by induction. To construct, let's see, uh, epsilon two is now at most um, one half epsilon one, which is itself at most one half. So construct uh, epsilon k with uh, zero less than epsilon k less than one half epsilon k minus one. Well, I guess uh, let's put it this way: epsilon k plus one. I'll just go to k plus one. How did I do it in the notes? Uh, well, no, I guess I'll just go ahead with the minus one. Sorry, epsilon k minus one. Um, 
so that epsilon k in particular is less than 2 to the minus k. And um, a pk in b pk minus 1, epsilon k minus 1, all right, which is in turn a subset of b p1 epsilon 1, okay. <coughs> There are these, you have nested balls. Okay, I'm just going to go inside this one now. All right, smaller and smaller inside. So that, because um, what do I have? I've got that um, that M3 bar does not contain um, all of this one, BP2. That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go to M3. It's rare. M3 bar. Therefore, it does not contain BP2, right? M3 bar. So I'm going to say, now put the M3 bar. It can't fill out the whole ball here, right? So there's got to be a little ball inside this, inside the M3 bar complement, okay? Now that little ball inside this, this little ball already, this little ball was already um, outside both M1 bar and M2 bar, okay? So now it's going to be outside all three, M1 bar, M2 bar, M3 bar. That's all you're doing. You just so so that uh, you just keep going, all right. So this is going to be uh, with um, B P K epsilon K, all right, um, and a subset of M uh, K bar complements. Okay, it's outside M K bar, all right, and it's in uh, B P K minus 1 epsilon k minus 1, which is itself outside all the other mk, um, all the other mj bars. Okay? So, uh, with b pk minus 1, epsilon k minus 1, a subset of r minus m1 bar Union, 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 M, K minus 1 bar. Okay. All right. So already that one was out. So now I'm actually doing the induction step. I'm saying what you have to do. Okay, you construct this P, K, and epsilon K less than 1 half epsilon K minus 1. I may have to make epsilon K much smaller than that in order to satisfy these properties. All right, but there does exist a positive epsilon K that does the job. I'm just saying it has to be minimally this small in order for my purposes. <clears throat> Anything smaller is fine. So that's on K. So there it is. So therefore, uh, B, P, K, Epsilon, K um, is inside all the other ones, all the other balls, okay, uh, is in R minus M1 bar, union, 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 M, K bar. Okay. Like that. Okay. And I'm done with the induction step. Okay, so now I've got the sequence PK. Consider PK in R now. Okay, this is a sequence of points. It was all inside this original ball. Okay, I claim that it's Cauchy. All right, claim PK is Cauchy. How do you do that? Well, you calculate the distance between Pn and Pm. Okay, let's say for m bigger than n. That's by the triangle inequality. Um, let's see, what do I need? Um, oh, I know it's easy that it's Cauchy. Well. I didn't show that in the notes. How do you prove it? This is this is less than or equal to d p n uh, p n plus one plus d p n plus one d p n excuse me p n plus two all the way out to plus dot 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 plus d p. He didn't show this in the book either. And uh, m minus one to p m where uh, M is bigger than N. Okay, that's a finite triangle inequality expansion, right? 
And now what's the distance? The distance between Pn and Pn plus 1, this is less than or equal to um, Pn plus 1 to Pn. Pn plus 1 is in the ball, the previous ball. Uh, where was it? It was right here. I'm going to use this equation right here. Okay, so pk to pk minus 1, what's the distance? Is it most um, epsilon k minus 1? All right, dpk, because this point is in this ball. Okay, so this between pk and pk minus 1 is less than epsilon k minus 1. Okay, which is less than 2 to the minus k plus 1 or something like that. Okay, excuse me, k minus 1. 2 to the minus k minus 1. Okay? Okay, so this is less than or equal to uh, 2 to the minus k, excuse me, 2 to the minus n. So using that, I'm just going one step to the next in this induction here. 2 to the minus n plus 2 to the minus n plus 1 plus 2 to the minus n plus 2 plus and so on plus 2 to the minus uh, m minus 1, okay? Which is a geometric sum, if I throw in all the rest of the terms, which is less than or equal to summation 2 to the minus j, j goes from n to infinity equals 2 to the minus n times 2 equals 2 to the minus n minus 1. Okay. It's an infinite geometric series, so that's easy enough. So that's, so therefore, um, that's independent of m. Okay? That's the whole point. This is pn, pm for m bigger than n. This is a bound depending only on the lower index. Therefore, the sequence is Cauchy. Okay? Hence, soup m bigger than n d p n p m uh, less than or equal to 2 to the minus n plus 1 goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay? Uh, maybe I should just put, put greater than or equal to capital n. That'll make you happier. Okay? <laughs> then I have a capital n here. Okay? Because 0 is capital n goes to infinity. There's the Cauchy condition. Okay? I have to take this part, the supreme of all these distances for M and N bigger than capital N. Okay, that's small. Okay, depending only on capital N. Okay, so the sequence is Cauchy. Okay, so this is verified. Okay, therefore let P equal the limit of PK. Therefore, that exists by completeness. So finally, we use completeness, okay, of R in this case. But all we're using, this is a general proof, all we use is the distance formula, triangle inequality, completeness of the original metric space is being used so far. Now the claim is that, of course, um, P, I want to show that P is in... Uh, what, uh, I need to get a contradiction. I need to show that P is actually in the first ball. It's actually in DP1, epsilon 1. Claim P belongs to BP1, epsilon 1. I chose epsilon 1 small enough that, um, excuse me, I chose these epsilon small enough that I couldn't get to the edge here, I claim. All right? Let's prove that. I think because I brought in this factor of one half that I reduced the uh, size of the ball small enough each time that I couldn't have reached the boundary over here. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. Did I do that correctly? Um, is that what I'm doing? Oh, actually, yeah. So P is in BN. Oh, I'm sorry. P is in BN for every N. Yeah, so I want to P's in B, and it's also in BP2, uh, epsilon 2, and it's also in all of them. Okay, let's see if it is true. Okay, so um, let's see, what did I do? I said that epsilon k was less than one half epsilon k minus 1. 
Is that going to do the job? Well, let's just see if it does. It looks a little mysterious. How would I get P in all of them? I think I can easily manufacture that. Um, when I chose P2, it could have been way over here on the edge, remember? Because uh, I didn't really know whether maybe it filled it. Somehow I couldn't get it. Uh, well, you know, you, it couldn't contain an open ball, so it could have been anywhere actually in here, I would think. I didn't say P2 had to be, the distance between P2 and P1 had to be less than one half epsilon 1. Did I say that? Maybe I needed to say that in my construction, darn it. I think I might have to say that. Let's see if we did that. I skipped something here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. He did a one-half epsilon one. <laughs> okay. So, I do need that. I need one last thing that I didn't put in the recipe. I needed that. Um, so, he's outside both M1. Okay. So, what I needed in my induction is that... Um, is what I wanted is that BK is in this over 2. Okay. Right here. I wanted this over 2. I want Actually, what I wanted, therefore, is that this is for K greater than or equal to 2. Okay. What I wanted is that I wanted my P2 to actually be close enough to P1. Okay. That I couldn't... All right, so that uh, if I took a string of these balls, they could go out to the boundary. Okay, that wouldn't be too good. I want to stay within the half circle, okay, for my P2. So I don't want my P2 to be way out here. I want my P2 to be close to P1. So I need, the condition was that I wanted, um, so back at the beginning, I needed, I wanted that uh, B2 is inside, um, See, what I wanted is that M2 bar does not contain not only P1 epsilon 1, which is true, but I wanted to say it does not contain this one, epsilon 1 over 2. It doesn't contain any open ball. So I can throw in this one half factor for free. I could make it one quarter, okay, one eighth, whatever, okay, because it doesn't contain any of these balls, okay. So I want to keep them close enough. Why is that? I want to show that P is in all of these. Okay? So this is my correction. I needed a correction on this. And so then that um, comes down to this formula. Okay? So the BK is in th this. This is still the same statement. Okay? This part of it. But I also want this box. Okay. So this is Cauchy. That followed without uh, using much. Okay, I actually could have said a little bit more because actually what I get is that PK, PK minus 1 is less than epsilon K minus 1 over 2. So I could get another factor here. That wouldn't have helped me in proving the Cauchy, but it's going to be important when I actually get to this other part, I think. Okay? So let's just check. Now I want to prove that now I need to show this claim. All right? So what is the distance between? I already have my P now. All right, P is somewhere in the space. Now, P N, P M, excuse me, P. This is less or equal to D P N, P M, plus this is between P M and P. Okay. Now, P M. All right, I've got I've got my m going to infinity. He's, so this is for m bigger than n. I've got my m. I've got so now what what do I have? I've got that. Uh, all right, I have to be a little bit more careful. Then this is less now. Now I have to be a little bit careful. What is the difference between pn and pm? Okay, I have that. The distance between pn and pm. I have to be a little bit more careful now. The Cauchy was easy to establish, but now I have to be a little bit more careful. The distance between PN and PM um, is less than or equal to um, 
distance between Pn and Pn plus 1. I needed to, do I need to establish this? Pm, yeah, plus and so on, plus the distance between P. Yeah, I need this. Okay. Let's see if I got it enough here. This is less than or equal to one half epsilon n. Okay. That's not enough. Do I need an extra one half? He's got one half epsilon. Yeah. Got this guy. Okay. Yeah, I'm not trying. I'm trying to not cheat you here. It looks like he's got a little bit uh, of a gap. Uh, I need to get the distance between PM. I need to get this distance, even though I've chosen my M bigger than he chose his M as a small number. And his n is the bigger one. So that's the only, I choose my m is the bigger one here. That's a little confusing to you, perhaps. So I'm choosing m bigger than n. But what I need to show is that pm has not strayed very far. Okay, it's still within the epsilon n ball. Okay, so let's see. I think I'm going to get, this is strictly less than a half epsilon plus, that's strictly less than a half. Maybe I'm just going to get strictly less. Plus, what's the next one? Uh, what's the difference between Pn, distance between Pn plus 1 and Pn plus 2? Maybe I'll have to use induction again. That's less than or equal to, uh, one, that's le strictly less than 1 half uh, epsilon n minus 1. And epsilon n minus 1 was less than, excuse me, n plus 1. Epsilon n plus 1 was strictly less than, um, Uh, one half epsilon n, right? So this is less than a quarter epsilon n, okay? <clears throat> By construction, I always choose less than one half. All right, so this was a quarter epsilon n and plus and so on. So I do that expansion. So this is equal to epsilon n. So I've got dpn pm less than epsilon n, okay, plus, um, okay, period. As a strict inequality. All right? So therefore, I have, uh, I need a little bit better than that, though. I need to shave off a little bit more. I need a third. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, let's see if I can get a little bit better. This was strictly less than this. Um, strictly less than this. Uh, so. Let's see. Uh, I use just a little bit of savings. Okay. Um, I'm going to put a three in here. <laughs> That's better. Okay. I'm just going to stick a three in here. Okay. <laughs> That's. It seems to make the proof a little bit easier for me. This is a ninth, a third and a ninth, a third. Uh, you may be able to do it with a half, but it's too hard to see for me right now. Okay? I'm just going to put 3 to the minus k. You have to be a little bit careful. Okay? This is equal to epsilon. If I add a third plus a ninth and so on, that only adds up to, to what? Uh, Two-thirds or something. One over one minus a third is, uh, excuse me, one third over, which is one over one half. It only adds up to a half, okay? Which is a half epsilon n. So I'm going to put a three here. That's my correction. So I've, I'm sorry. 
So this was a 3 to the minus k divided by 3 and all that. So I put 3 to the minus n's and all this calculation. The Cauchy part is trivial, basically speaking. Okay? That doesn't depend on whether it's a 3 or a 2. But I have to be a little bit careful uh, in showing that dpn pm is strictly less than a half n. Okay, so then if I go back up to this line, So I'm showing you where you have to be careful. You have to be careful so that the, it's not hard to show that the sequence is Cauchy, even if you don't even make it uh, P2 close to P1, all right, within the, the half ball or the, the third ball, okay? That's not going to be the problem as long as I'm making the radii of the ball small enough. The sequence is going to be Cauchy, okay? But now if I really want to keep this P inside all of the balls, then I have to make sure. All right? So then I've got the DPN PM is less than or equal to uh, one-half epsilon N plus DPM P for M bigger than N. Now I have that. Okay, which is the same thing he had. So I've just got a less than or equal to there. Okay, now I take the limit m to infinity and obtain that dpn p is less than or equal to one half epsilon n. That's a constant. You see, we couldn't have less than one half, one half epsilon because when I take the limit, uh, well, actually, I did. I could have just said that plus zero. Uh, let's see, is that right? Yeah, I could have because it was strictly less than. That was a constant in M. Okay. So I could have gotten away without the 3. I was just equals 1 half epsilon N. What I had was a strict less than epsilon N here. Okay. But he's got a strict less than 1 half epsilon N. Okay, which I don't see at all. Okay, I see a minor error in here. But the idea of the proof is clear. Okay. But he still needs, he needs a factor less than 1 here. Okay must be less than 1. Less than or equal to 1. Okay. <laughs> All right. Therefore, P is in B, P, N, epsilon N. Okay? For every N. Okay. Therefore, P is in R minus the union m k bar k goes from 1 to infinity because if it's in because if it's in all those p's it's outside all the m's inside all the p's means outside all the m's if it's inside p p1 it's outside m1 bar if it's inside ep2 it's outside m2 bar but it is in both of them okay therefore it's outside all of them therefore it's outside this equals R minus R equals a null set because if I take the union of all the closures that's in fact more than the at least more than the union of all the sets themselves which is itself equal to R that was the assumption so this is the contradiction so I have a point outside the space contradiction finally <laughs> okay all right sorry for taking so long on that one but uh, anyway, the idea is clear, except for the fact that maybe it's not clear how to make sure that this P is in all of them. Okay, but basically it was close enough. It was close enough to P1, and they had a big enough ball. It was close to P2, so that it stayed inside all of them. Okay, by the computation, you can see that. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful here. So if you're familiar with geometric series, it's not that big of a deal, okay? Basically, you had to do this, <laughs> one-third instead of one-half. And then for the real proof, you could just use one-half because you only needed strict inequality here. This is a fixed constant. I was letting m go to infinity. That goes to zero. This goes to dpnp. Therefore, let's see, is that right? If I have strict less than in the limit, uh, actually, no, in the limit, I still have to consider uh, less than or equal to. So I don't know. I don't know how I got rid of his... Now you still you still have to get rid of I don't know how we got the 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 two instead of the three. Okay. In that proof. Okay. 
All right, so there may be a, a minor error in the book there. Okay, we'll skip it. Um, so that's the theorem, 472. Let's summarize it one last time, and let's say there are, non there are some examples. Um, let's see, let me give you a quick example. Uh, 472, then if x is complete, then uh, x is not meager. It is not a meager set in itself. Okay, so it cannot be written as a convolutional kind of union of rare sets. Um, okay, what's an example? Example. What he's going to do is he's going to give an example for a set, uh, a space that is uh, meager in itself, and therefore it must be incomplete. Okay, so example. X equals all polynomials um, X of T equals alpha 0 plus alpha 1 T plus and so on plus alpha n T to the n n greater than or equal to um, 0 okay <laughs> okay instead of all polynomials with the with the norm the norm of the X is going to be the maximum of the coefficients in abs of the in absolute value. Okay? It's a finite expansion, so I can just say max j alpha j. Alright? The dimension of x, I mean, that is the, the degree of x will depend on x. Alright? Each x has a finite degree. And therefore, this j goes from 1, uh, 0, 1 up to n sub x. Okay? The degree of x. Okay, so that's a norm. So actually, I do have a metric space, a norm space. I'll, I'll not go through that. That's a norm. Okay. Um, but how do I um, show that um, that this is uh, meager? That it's meager in itself. I, I'll just consider Pn equal polynomials of degree at most n, or exactly yeah, at most n. Okay, so that means the all expansion is up to size n. Okay, I claim that that is itself its own closure. The Pn equals Pn bar. Okay, as follows. If um, xk equals alpha 0 super k plus alpha 1 super k t plus and so on plus alpha n super k t to the n goes in norm to x equals beta 0 plus beta 1 t plus and so on plus beta sub capital N t to the capital N, so some fixed polynomial of degree capital N, all right? So the capital N is fixed, and the little n is fixed, because xk can't go outside uh, the pn, all right? xk has got to be something in the pn, so this is to prove this. That it's, that the space, that this set is its own closure, well, uh, that means that alpha 0 super k, my, the max, alpha z super minus beta 0, uh, alpha 1 super k minus beta 1 up to alpha super k n minus beta n, and then if there were some more coefficients, beta n plus 1 and so on, and n plus 1 up to beta to capital N, this has to go to 0 as k goes to infinity. Well, capital N and little n are fixed, so that means all these betas here have to be zero, okay? Because they can't, if, if any of these beta n plus one or beta sub capital N were positive, were not negative, I mean, in absolute value, then I would not go to zero, because the maximum would still stay, stay away from zero. So all these coefficients automatically have to be zero, 
Okay, and then all these go to zero. So the alpha zero goes to beta zero and so on and so forth. But therefore, my x is already in Pn. Okay? <laughs> so I don't get outside. Therefore, it's its own closure. Moreover, these guys are rare. Okay, by the same token, um, Pn is rare. Because what is it? Um, because certainly b x epsilon, okay, if I take one of these x, uh, x in Pn, okay, um, those contains um, x plus um, epsilon over 2 t to the n plus 1. I just add one more term that's very small in its component, but that's going to be in the ball, right? So that, so, which is not in Pn equals Pn bar. Okay. So these guys are rare, and the union is the whole space. Okay. In some sense, though, this, there's not very many of these polynomials, but I guess they're uncountable since the alphas are in uncountable coefficients. They didn't have to just give the rational ones. Okay, so this is an uncountable set of polynomials. Okay, but they're still rare. Okay, so X is a union of Pn, uh, rare union, a uh, union of rares. So therefore, X is incomplete. <laughs> okay, which you could show probably independently as well. But there was an easier application uh, in 474. They show it using a different theorem. What we're going to do is we're going to use this bare category theorem to prove the uniform boundariness theorem. We'll do that next time. And then we're going to have all these corollaries. And then there's just a couple pages in 48 and 49. We're going to spend all week on 47. Okay, so today we got the bare category theorem and a little bit more this example. So this is, he's going to repeat this example. He's going to repeat the example. Uh, as an application, direct application of uniform boundedness there, where it's a little bit easier to see. You don't have to prove this closure business and the rareness and all that. But I thought it would be good to see an example where you can see the whole guts of the problem right there. It's, maybe we don't have much intuition about it yet, but um, it's a bit of a strange norm, obviously, that norm. Yeah. Okay. So...